gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine, I can sing all is mine. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Saviour He will stay. I labour on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my peace. Oh, the chains are released, I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, Yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Oh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, our 10 a.m. service this morning. And it's lovely to be able to greet you uh, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, wasn't it just lovely to have those two songs in our pre-service uh, time, uh, rem remembering who Jesus is and what it is that we are able to do for him in his strength alone. Uh, this morning, uh, we're going to be continuing in our sermon series on the book of Philippians. And uh, we come to that marvellous section where Paul describes how he has learnt the secret of contentment. Uh, that's something that has been very... Uh, uh, much uh, on my mind and heart this past week and uh, certainly uh, I think as Christians 
we certainly need to know about how to live the contented life uh, as God's people, wherever he has us. So looking forward to opening up God's word with you a bit later this morning uh, in this great section of God's word in the book of Philippians. We know that we don't always live the way God has intended for us. The Bible encourages us to acknowledge our need for forgiveness and acknowledges us as who we are and uh, what we need to do before him. And as the people of God, we gather together today uh, to be his people and to recognise that we need his help to live his way. In Psalm 51 verse 17, we read that the sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. And then we come to the book of 1 John, where we say that if we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We um, hear those words and we want to do serious business with God. He's a holy God, a loving God and merciful. So let's come to our Heavenly Father and let's acknowledge our need for forgiveness. And so we pray together. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have often gone our own way and rejected your will for our lives. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you in every way, for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Give praise to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. We're going to sing or have our first song, Behold Our God. in his hands who has numbered every grain of sand kings and nations tremble at his voice all creation rises to rejoice given counsel to the Lord who can question any of his words who can teach the one who knows all things who can fathom all his wondrous deeds behold our God seated on his throne Come, let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. Who has felt the upon his hands bearing all the guilt of sinful man God eternal humble to the grave Jesus Savior risen now to reign behold our God 
God, seated on his throne, come let us adore him, behold our King, nothing can compare, come let us adore adore him behold our king nothing can compare come let us adore him Thank you, George. Thank you, Jess. Uh, we're going to now come to a time where we focus on a ministry. And this morning, uh, you um, will notice on your Mac update, if you'd like to grab that uh, with me, a picture of Sam Trotter. There's a bit of a write-up there of some of the things that Sam is currently doing and hopes to do over the next two years. And so this morning, we're going to hear in person from Sam. So welcome, Sam, and uh, come and share with us. Hello everyone. So I just wanted to give you an update on what I'm doing and how my plans for next year are going. So next year for two years, I'm studying youth and children's ministry at YouthWorks College through the MTS pathway. Um, I started one unit of my study this semester to ease back into study because I haven't studied in five or six years. So that's been a bit of an adjustment and a challenge to get back into that mindset, but I'm really enjoying that now. And I found it really encouraging just how much I've been learning, even with just the one unit at the moment. And I'm really excited for doing that full time and just how much I'll learn from that. Um, so at the moment I'm doing Acts and the New Testament letters, which has been really interesting. I hadn't fully read through Acts before, so that's been um, really great to read through and see how the early church spread and how God worked through that. Um, finance wise, I've raised about half of my support so far. I wanted to thank all of those who have already been supporting me or have spoken to me about doing that. And I, if I could encourage um, others to think about doing that and pray about whether that's something that you're able and willing to do. Um, there's a link in the Mac update each week that you can click on to do that or I also have forms or you can speak to me in person about that. There's a few people who have been giving through the church mission fund, which is also fine. Um, just if you make sure you label it um, so that Les knows where to direct that. Um, but if you do it through the MTS website and the link on the um, email, then that's the best way because that way you can have it tax deductible. Um, but apart from financially supporting um, if you could all be praying for me, please. Um, just uh, especially in adjusting to finding a balance between um, reading God's word um, for my study and finding personal time with him and making sure I'm um, still growing in my personal walk with him. If you could be praying for that. Um, and also just for wisdom in what ministries to take on next year. So um, I'll be working under Rochelle. She's my trainer for next year and the year after. So I'm primarily doing children's and youth ministries, which I'm already involved in, but I've been taking on a few other things like the 5 p.m. rostering and I'm considering whether to do SRE and those kinds of things. So just wisdom in uh, finding a good balance of what ministries to do, but not taking on so much that I'm not giving any of them my full attention. Um, and also just that I could finish raising the rest of my support so that I don't have to stress about that too much while I'm studying too. And that's about it. Thank you. Mm. 
Well, look, it's very exciting. Sam, come and stand up here. Uh, <laughs> it's very exciting. Uh, here we have someone who, in a sense, is desiring to serve the Lord with their life, as we all do, I trust. Uh, but someone who wants to be uh, fully given and committed. And uh, we just want to uphold Sam uh, in this in an ongoing way and partner with you uh, in this uh, great step. So it's wonderful. And why don't we pray for Sam now and please uh, catch up with her after the service and find out more about uh, what she's doing. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the way you have been so merciful and kind to Sam and uh, given her gifts to use and a willingness to make the Lord Jesus known. Uh, we thank you for her love for the young people in our church. And Lord, we thank you that you have laid on her heart the desire to do MTS. We thank you for all the things that she is currently learning. And we uh, do pray that you would form her to be more like the person you have made her to be in Christ. How we thank you for your promise, Lord, that you will conform us all into the likeness of your dear son. So pray we would, you would do that to Sam. Uh, we pray that you might please provide for her financial needs uh, as she does MTS over the next two years. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would please help her to be wise in the ways in which she seeks to serve you with various opportunities. Lord, please guide her, help her to work well with Rochelle, her trainer. And uh, please uh, may you provide a, a great and good, clear platform for her to serve the people of God here and serve in the community at Mittagong. Uh, thank you for her role with Follow Youth in primary. Uh, thank you for her uh, desire uh, to look at other possibilities as well. Lord, we pray that in the context, context of her study, that she would maintain a personal, daily, devoted walk with you. Uh, please make her strong in the Lord's and may uh, the uh, gifts that you've given her blossom fully that we might give you the praise and the glory for her. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Thank you. Well, Sam is a person who desires to serve the Lord with all her life. Uh, we need encouragement to do that. And one of the ways we encourage one another is to affirm what it is we believe to be our faith, to give verbal assent to the things that we hold in our heart. And the wonderful way of doing that is to actually talk the scriptures to one another, the word of God. There's a wonderful creed like or hymn in the book of Philippians that we're looking at, and uh, it's from Philippians chapter 2. I just want to encourage us all now, let's um, say these wonderful words together that talk about who Jesus is. Together we say, Jesus Christ, in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Well, let's uh, now pray to the Lord who is sovereign and over all, who hears our prayers. And let's join together in the Lord's Prayer. Together, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Thank you, thank you, uh, Carly. Let's continue in praying to our loving Heavenly Father. Our oh, Father, thank you that we can call you Father because your Son Jesus taught us to do so. And thank you that we can come to, directly into your presence through the Spirit whom, your God is, whom you, God the Father, have given through your Son. And so, Father, we come to you this morning through Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to pray as this little part of your family called Mittagong Anglican Church. And, oh, Father, how encouraged we have been and are still being encouraged by this book of, book of Philippians. And, Father, in these days when we're still battling, even here in New South Wales, we're so much better off than particularly people in Victoria. Thank you that we know that despite COVID, your word is not bound. And Father, we realise that when Paul wrote those words, he was in prison. So Father, we just praise and thank you that your word is not bound. And Father, thank you so much for your servant, Matthew. Thank you for his faithfulness. Thank you for his gift in Bible teaching, which he's using to enrich, to enrich us all. And at the moment, as he grieves his precious mother, Geraldine, thank you that he and Kathy have the assurance, again in the words of Philippians, that Geraldine is now with her Lord, which is far better. And Father, with the funeral tomorrow, we just pray that the Lord Jesus Christ will be exalted and that Matthew will have a peace of rest, comfort, assurance and sustaining. And thank you for the way, so, the way in which Kathy so lo lovingly supports him. And Father, as we think of Matthew and family grieving, we realise that across our church, there are many with varying, varying levels of sickness, grief, and psychological problems. And Father, we pray at this time for our senior minister, Michael, not with us today, as he's recovering and not allowed to drive after a cataract operation. Father, we pray it will be 100% successful. And thank you so much for, for Michael's ongoing ministry among us. And we do think, think of others among us from this service, and particularly from the eight o'clock and 11, uh, 12 o'clock service who are sick and grieving. And Father, we think of, thank you so much. That, um, thank, that, thank you so much that Peter Jones is now back home. And Father, we ask that you'll continue to strengthen and help, help him and Kathy after this long period of illness. We think, we think, we think too of, of um, what, of Robin, Robin Nimbrick and Damien Ryle. We think too of, of others, with other seniors living in lockdown. Father, we think of Arthur, Arthur Wardle and Ga Gary Moran, both normally come to church, but of both Harvison and Anthem, not allowed to go out. Father, be with them and encourage them. And for those that are more seriously in, uh, in lockdown, John, um, John Livingston, we may have nearly forgotten Pam McEwen, who was, with her son, with her husband used to come, with Jim, used to come to church so regularly. We just pray for those people. But at the other end of, end of the scale, Father, we realise that the school holidays are coming up. And Father, we pray for safety. For all who are travelling, for all whatever, whatever they're, they're doing. Father, we've just heard Sam speaking and she, together with Rochelle and our Father, how we praise you for Rochelle. We just pray that you will consistently uphold Rochelle, uh, Rochelle and Matt and their three boys. But as, as Rochelle and 
Michelle and Sam in the first week of the holidays go, go, go down to Caring Bar with four teenagers, the parents of all who come to this service. Father, we, we, pray, we pray for um, April and for Amos and for Eli and for Zach, that they will be built up in their faith, that they will leave school, not this year, but they'll leave school looking, looking to you. And Father, with it not being the usual excitement of a living camp and having to drive back and forth between the Shire and here four times a week and at night going, coming home, we just plead their, their, their safety. And Father, as we look around this church, we've got a group of people that we so rarely pray for. Thank you for those who keep the church clean and sanitised in absolutely every way so that we are among the privileged few that can come to you and worship. <laughs> and Father, we pray for our nominators. Father, we thank you so much for Michael and Matthew's ministry, but at the same time, we pray that in your perfect time, you will bring the man of your choice. Thank you that our nominators of men and women have experienced experience and godly men and women who work, walk closely with yourself. And Father, as we pray for our new rector, we pray also for his wife and children, particularly if they happen to be teenagers, prepare them for the move. Father, we know your time is perfect and we know you have our new rector already chosen and in your time, please lead them to him. And Father, we do pray for our nation in these days of COVID-19. Father, we re if we've only got to watch our screens, screens to, screens to, screens to know that we're coping as well, well above average in how we cope. And we say thank you. And Father, we just pray for all our leaders from uh, our federal, state, local, and particularly those who know you and love you. And whatever tradition they express their faith, whether it's in um, Sydney Anglican, Anglicanism, whether it's in a Pentecostal a a a sort or Orthodox or Catholic, we just pray for every man and woman who is representing us, who is a person in Christ. May they look to you. May they realise the need to be humble. And may their decisions guide us wisely and enable us to live for your glory. And Father, we, we give praise and thank you for the Haddons. And we find that we marvel at the way you're using that couple, that that couple, and the two girls that are with them, and in their high 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 rise apartment, they're beaming the gospel out, out, not just to San Diego and Chile, but to Peru, and even beyond through the, their local churches, Bible study. And Father, we do pray for that city of San Diego where. It's so divided between wealth and wealth and extreme poverty, with so much of it unbuilt after last year's riots. We just ask that you'll use Gary and Julie and Alicia and Anika there in San Diego to be show your healing and mercy. And finally, Father, most of us find it difficult to talk about needing money. But Father, we, we again get this in Philippians, we're not quite up to it, where Paul thanks God that they are generous givers. And so Father, we pray for our church here and for our linked missionaries that you will meet their needs and that we, like the Philippian Christians, will know the joy of giving for your glory. And Father, we know that in our giving, the most important thing is to follow that example that we've just testified about in uh, from Philippians, to humble ourselves, empty ourselves, as did our Saviour, for, uh, for our church here, our neighbourhood, and wherever else you place us. Amen. <laughs>
We're going to come now to the reading of God's word. So let us pray that uh, the Lord would uh, open up our hearts to receive that word. Let's pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, give us faith to receive your word and understanding to know what it means and the will to put it into practice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, uh, Joan and Kathy are going to read God's word for us. Uh, you'll find these readings in the uh, sermon handout this morning if you'd like to follow. Our first reading is from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 10. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Our second reading is from Philippians chapter 4, 10 to 13. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to, to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in, every, in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Well, last week I was saying to Kathy, wouldn't it be good to be always content? That in every circumstance to experience contentment. I would venture to say, wouldn't we all like to experience contentment throughout our lives? A common misunderstanding about contentment is it's the absence of problems. Now, if that was the case, contentment, if that was contentment, we would all be in big trouble. Most Christians I know struggle with contentment. We find it easier to be discontented than contented. And I believe that's got a lot to do with affluenza. The more you have, the more discontent you are. Well, the news is there's a vaccine for that one. In God's providence and kindness, he's included this testimony of Paul in scripture for our benefit to equip us as Christians. And he claims to have learnt the secret of being content in any and every situation. Well, I'm all ears. And as we consider our first point this morning, contentment for Paul, let's just remind ourselves a bit about the context or the circumstances that he writes. Remember with me that he's in prison, unfairly I might add. He's chained to Roman guards around the clock. He's um, isolated. He's unable to move about. He's waiting a trial to a Nero. Basically his life is on the line. Also there's been some local pastors in Rome who are envious of Paul's giftedness. They've resorted to a smear campaign. So his reputation has come under attack. 
it's an incredibly trying time for him and he had little of what this life considers benefit. Ten years have passed since he brought the gospel to Philippi. Ten years since he was thrown in prison in Philippi and then got released. Ten years since the jailer and his family had come to know the Lord. Ten years since he had moved on to Thessalonica. Uh, the Philippians sent him financial aid at that point. And then he moved on into the region of Achaia, went to the cities of Athens and Corinth, and they sent him another, another gift then. But it's now 10 years without any further support. With all of this going on, wouldn't you expect Paul to be crushed? Look at what he says, verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have re revived your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Literally, he says to them, your love has bloomed again. I know you have been concerned for me, he writes. You just didn't have opportunity to bloom. It hadn't been the right season for you until now. Now, we can't be sure why it took them so long to send him the support. But you see, he's re rejoicing greatly in the Lord that after this long wait, the opportunity has now finally come and they have revived his, their concern for him. Epaphroditus has come from Philippi with their gift to him. Paul knew it was all in God's hands. There was no need to manipulate people to get what he thought he wanted or needed. He was certain that in due time, God would order the circumstances so that his need would be met. And that's why he rejoices in the Lord. God has made it possible and provided the opportunity. You see, when you truly know that your times and your seasons and opportunities of life are all controlled by the sovereign hand of God. You are content. Someone better than you is running it. This is where contentment begins. We will never know contentment until we truly believe that God is sovereign and is ordering everything for your good and for his glory so that everything is going to be fine. Next, contentment for Paul was learned in what he experienced. In verses 11 to 12. I am not saying this, he says, because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. Brothers and sisters, he didn't learn contentment by sitting in a classroom, nor in uh, you know, lecture theatres and obtaining the next degree. It wasn't head knowledge for him. He learned it in times of adversity as he followed his Lord in life. To be discontent would mean Paul wanted to be somewhere else rather than accepting where God's sovereign hand had put him. And wherever that was, he found that Christ is all sufficient. And as he writes, he needs, his need is great and it's deep. But there is no discontentment. He was so satisfied with very little. Now, this is so far from people's expectations today. The attitude today is anything but satisfaction with little. The new religion today is meeting my needs. But everything is a need. Getting all my needs met is the quest. And when that's the quest, there is going to be a lot of discontentment in the ranks. Paul knew that it wasn't about trying to figure out 
how to meet his human needs. It was living to the glory of God who created him regardless. He's not denying difficulty. He's not denying the hard circumstances. He's simply content in God's provision and satisfied with very little. Even in those times when he had more than he needed, his contentment is not based on those times or wanting those times again. No, he sought contentment in Christ both in want and in plenty and in any and every situation. The one thing that steals our contentment the most are bad circumstances. We forget who is sufficient and who satisfies and where our peace and our joy is found. Regardless of our circumstances, the promise in the Bible is the all-sufficient Lord Jesus is with us. He'll never leave us. And at the end of the day, he is your only sufficiency. You will have nothing else as you breathe your last. But since he is all sufficient for you for all eternity, he is no less so now as well. And contentment for Paul is because he learnt the secret of it. Verses 12 to 13. His secret he learned is this, that regardless of whatever is going on in his life, Paul can do all things through Christ who gives him strength. Now, friends, he's not talking about strength so he can flap his arms and fly to the moon. He's not saying that. It is because he had so thoroughly linked his life to Christ that he has the strength of the Lord in every situation. Time and again, he was at the point where he was at the end of his resources. Kathy was telling me this week, about a minister and his wife in a parish in Sydney who recently suffered the death of their five-year-olds. I mean, there are some most tremendously difficult things that are just beyond what we can endure. Where you reach the extremity and what you find is the Lord's strength is right there when you have no way of coping. And this is what brings contentment, even in the most difficult times, when you have learned not to depend on your own resources, when you have been in the desert or the valley, when you have stood in the valley of the shadow of death, when you're on the brink and you can't resolve your problems and you can't eliminate the conflict, and he can't solve the marriage. And he can't do anything about the kids. And he can't change the environment at work you're in. You have no way of dealing with the disease that's racking your body. And you're at the end of your own resources. And you see, you turn to God and you find the strength that there, is, that there is to go through that situation. Living for Christ, being content is knowing you can do all things for doing his will in the strength that God supplies you. The most marvellous promise for the person whose desire it is to obey the Lord. And so why should you pursue contentment? Friends, God commands it. It's for your good and for his glory. Hebrews 13, 5. Be content with what you have. Then contentment is the greatest form of riches. 1 Timothy 6, 6. There is great gain in godliness with contentment. The jewel of a contented heart is precious in God's sight and lasts for eternity. then murmuring and discontent is a great sin. 
do you pine and grumble for the pre-COVID days? When we grumble, we don't believe God is in control and we question his will for our lives. Contentment is recognising God has put us where we are right now and has us where we are for a reason. And so we accept that he is sovereign, whether in relative ease or in times of want. Then without contentment, we forego the peace of God. For being discontent breeds turmoil for our souls and pursue contentment because this enables us to worship him. We recognise what he gives and withholds are his will and for the best for us. When we're not content, we cannot truly delight ourselves in God. What about some dangers of discontentment? You might have heard this story before, but uh, there was a guy by the name of John who um, entered the Monastery of Silence. And he was told by the abbot he could stay as long as he liked, as long as he didn't speak a word. Well, after five years, the abbot called Brother John in and he said to him, look, you've been here five years. You may speak two words. Hard bed. I'm sorry to hear that, said the abbot. We'll get you a better bed. You have for another five years. Brother John, you've been here another five years. You may speak two words. Cold food. I'm sorry to hear that. We'll make sure the food is better for you. You go forward another five years. Brother John, you've been here now 15 years. You may speak another two words. I quit. And so the abbot replied, well, it's probably for the best. You've done nothing but complain since you got here. Now, Jeremiah Burroughs, the 17th century Puritan, says, when we grumble at our lot, it's like the child of the king crying and stomping his feet when he loses a toy. Paul writes in Philippians 2, do everything without grumbling and complaining. Sometimes there is legitimate times to pour out complaint to the Lord. And I think of the Psalms. He cries out to the Lord time and time again. But is it right for me to grumble when I'm sitting in traffic? Or I get delayed and I'm late for the appointment? Is it right for me to grumble when Kathy doesn't buy the right brand of cereal? Or grumble if the kids are just making too much noise? Is it all comes from a heart of discontent. It's not living as a child of God in order that we might shine like stars in the universe. Being discontent doesn't help our witness for Christ and it points to ourselves and not to him. Maybe this morning is a time to repent of those murmurings and grumblings which mar our Christian life and witness. I'm just going to pause for a, a moment. Can I ask you to quietly do that now, if you wish? Father, thank you for hearing our prayers and work in our hearts by your spirit. Amen. What about our fourth point this morning, finding contentment in affliction? It says there, um, the world, contentment comes by simply removing affliction as believers we find it in the midst of them. God is at work to use them for our good, like a father disciplines his children, it says in Hebrews 12. And so we recognise the hand of the Lord and we see it as his mercy. There's Paul at prison, so easily he could have thought, what a setback to the mission of sharing Christ. He could have just sat back and waited so that the real ministry could resume. 
Rather, what we see in Philippians is that his ministry continued as a prisoner for Christ. Not long ago, there was a survey conducted. The question was, what do you live for? 94% of people said that they were waiting for something to happen, to get married, to get a new job, to have kids, for the kids to leave, and so on. People are living for something else to take place. As believers, the question is, what is my present duty in the circumstances that I'm in? Carrying that through to please God, no matter the difficulty, is vital for Christian contentment. Contentment doesn't mean that we face life without pain. It does mean that in the midst of our affliction, we are able to find peace in God's sovereign control. Isn't it good to know that those who love God, all things work together for good, who are called according to his purpose. And his purpose is for our spiritual good, to conform us to the likeness of his son. He is good. He is faithful. He is for us. You can be confident in affliction and difficulty. You face at the moment by recognising that God is always working for our good and for his glory. And then contentment, a longing for heaven. We know where, where our citizenship is. And we are longing to go there by doing what the Lord gives us to do. We understand that the sufferings we face in this present time aren't worth comparing with the glory that's to be revealed in us. If you pursue the things of this world to try to satisfy you, as we looked at Ecclesiastes, it is a chasing after the wind. As believers, we are to look for not for the things that we can see, but what are unseen, because as we fix our eyes on heaven, we recognise that our afflictions and trials are preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond our all comparison. We long for heaven, and this longing produces contentment. Now none but Christ can satisfy. No other name for me. There's love and life and lasting joy for Lord Jesus found in thee. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only first in my heart. High King of heaven, thy treasure thou art. Imagine being able to say, I am content no matter what my circumstances are. I can get along with little. I can know what it is to have much. I am content whether I'm well hungry, I'm, I'm fed or, well, or hungry or wealthy or in great need. I, I can do all things through my Lord who strengthens me. Imagine being able to live like that. We can. We can. We have all we need in Christ. Alex Mottu in his commentary on Philippians says, no circumstance could ever arise which would be too much for Paul's God and therefore no circumstance could ever beat Paul. Paul's God is our God. So when we lack contentment that Paul enjoyed and exemplified, it is not because we do not have what we need to enjoy it. It is because our eyes are on the wrong place. They are on our circumstances instead of upon our Saviour. Do you need to know what it is to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? If so, then remember that all joy for your soul and all power for your life is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you will look to him and trust him and live for him and worship him and adore him and serve him, and follow him and obey him, then this joy will increase by filling your soul. 
I need this. You need this. We all need this. You are either in a very difficult set of circumstances right now or you are about to head into some. God had only one son without sin, but he has many sons. He has no sons without sorrow. You will know what it is to be empty. You may know what it is to be full. But this is the secret which Paul has let us know about. That you can have all you need in Christ and you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Only when we understand that Christ is big enough to satisfy us can we be content no matter what the particular circumstances satisfied with the circumstances and not just despite them. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, we long to know this secret in our daily experience that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That in the midst of whatever is on our place, whatever you give us, we might be content knowing that you are for us in Christ, you provide for us, you know, and that you are doing your faithful work, Father. Lord, some of us have to go through very difficult times. Please, Father, give us the eyes and vision on you and knowing that we can do all these things through Christ who gives us strength. For we pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a um, lovely song that uh, is to be sung that uh, reminds us that everything, all our days and our times, are known to the Lord and we can trust him who is faithful to the end. of peace and days of rest in times of loss and loneliness though rich or poor your word is true that all my ways are known to you no trial has come beyond your hand no step I walk beyond your plan. The path is dark outside my view. Still all my ways are known to you. And oh, what peace that I have found wherever I may be. For all my ways are known to you, hallelujah, they are known to you. I do not fear the final night, for death will be the door to life. You take my hand and lead me through, for all my ways are known to you. And oh, what peace.
peace that I have found wherever I may be. For all my ways are known to you. Hallelujah, they are known to you. Open up my eyes so I may see that you have made these ways for me. Open up my eyes so I may see that you, my God, will walk with me. Open up my eyes so I may see that you have made these ways for me. Open up my eyes so I may see that you, my God, will walk with me. And oh, what peace that I have found wherever I may be. For all my ways are known to you. Hallelujah, they are known to you. And oh, what peace that I have found wherever I may be. For all my ways are known to you. Hallelujah, they are known to you. Hallelujah, they are known to you. Well, friends, we go into another week. Uh, circumstances, everything is out of our control. We may have some certainty about what may happen, but many other things may not. Isn't it good to know, as we just sung, that was sung, that all our times, all things are known to the Lord and our lives are in his hands. That's a great comfort for us as we go out to serve this week. I just encourage you to stay, uh, encourage one another uh, over morning tea at the tables and uh, maybe catch up with Sam a bit more about MTS and uh, her plans. Let's uh, say these words from 1 Thessalonians 5 as we conclude together. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Amen. Thanks everyone.